at an elevated alkaline phosphatase or elevated ALP, which is a liver specific test, um, or sorry, and in addition, a disease specific antibody. And so that is either AMA, which is anti mitochondrial antibody, or in the absence of that, anti GP210 or SP100. Again, they're very specific antibodies in the context of PBC. So, should we be biopsying patients? I think we all know that taking a liver biopsy, which is a small sample of the liver, is not generally required in the presence of those blood tests we talked about to diagnose PBC. And there is some caveats to that. And the main caveats are if actually in the blood tests you don't have these AMA positivity or these specific antibodies, then there is uncertainty. And that's important then to get a liver biopsy to see whether or not there actually might be underlying disease. And secondly, sometimes we know these diseases can overlap with other conditions, and that includes an autoimmune or inflammatory hepatitis, which can often present with patients having very similar symptoms to PBC, but also with high transaminase levels. So their ALT and AST, which are another liver enzymes in the blood, can be high. Or we also know it can overlap with steatotic liver disease, it's gone, undergone a, a variety of name changes recently, but realistically, patients who might have some fat in the liver or other metabolic risk factors may actually have this overlapping alongside their PBC. And in that instance, we might want to take a liver biopsy in order to clarify what's causing the majority of the problem and offer additional treatment if that's the case. And in some patients, there are other coexisting systemic conditions or extrahepatic conditions in which we want to kind of find out whether or not that there is going to be an impact on our treatment strategy and the results that we see. And you can see just down the bottom, just for illustration again, here are some typical images that you might find in a patient who has PSC by looking down the microscope. So that's on liver histology. So histology basically means looking at the architecture of the liver down a microscope by taking a sample from the liver. And on the far left hand side, you'll see evidence of an inflammatory infiltrate um, around an area of a bile duct. And progressively, as you go to the right, you'll see an increase in uh, fibrosis and scarring. And on the far right hand side, you see this cirrhosis that we talked about before. And cirrhosis, as I say, is a more advanced scarring um, and just basically means um, that you have some, some bridges of scarring throughout the liver and some nodule formation. So as clinicians, we have lots of different guidelines that have been developed and evolved over time for being able to diagnose and manage patients who have PBC. And guidelines really are consensus statements of evidence that's been brought together by numbers of specialists and their advocates. And there's lots of extensive recommendations on managing and diagnosing uh, PBC, but actually they're, they're quite heavy to read. In fact, the two guidelines I've put up there, so the Easel Clinical Practice Guideline and the one in front of them, the BSG, so the British Society of Gastroenterology Guideline, published in 2017 and 2018 respectively. I mean, in Easel, there are 42 different recommendations. And so for your average clinician to whom a patient who has PBC will present, they may not have read them in great detail and they may not know them off by heart. And we know that the guideline adoption is poor in practice because, as I say, whilst the specialists that write them and the specialists who manage these patients in large volumes know a lot about them, actually your average gastroenterologist or even gastroenterologist with hepatology interest or even just hepatologist may not know them so well. And we know that most patients with PBC are seen outside of a kind of specialist autoimmune unit. And therefore, there has been a lot of effort developed into trying to develop care pathways. And that's really just a simplified message, both for physicians and also for patients, so that we can establish a minimum standard of care for patients who have PBC. So it's a simplified step-by-step -step guide, and it's really designed to complement, not to replace the clinical guidelines we already have. And it provides a decision tree. So it kind of says to you, well, if this happens, then we should do this next. And if this happens, then maybe we should think about this. And it means that the, the right patient will hopefully see the right clinician and actually the right treatment will be instigated at the right time for that person 
bearing in mind all of the kind of individualization that we have to have for PBC management. So I'm going to talk you a little bit through the integrated um, care pathway for PBC. I think it's important and just going to really highlight the key things that I think as patients you should be very much aware of and as physicians we should also take into account. So I think the first thing to say is that we may need to make sure we get the diagnosis right at the beginning. And so patients who have suspected PBC, as I mentioned before, will present with abnormal liver biochemistry um, and that abnormal liver chemistry will usually be an elevated alkaline phosphatase or gamma GT or a bilirubin. But also these patients will often have uh, symptoms, as, as you well know, and these symptoms, as I alluded to before, may include severe itching, significant fatigue, aching, potentially sicker symptoms with dry eyes, dry mouth. And at that point, every physician should be doing a basic history, a physical examination, and requesting an ultrasound in order to be able to confirm that diagnosis. Um, and, and with regards to the history, we're really thinking about asking um, not just about kind of basic demographics like age and gender, but also thinking about if there's any evidence of other autoimmune diseases in yourself or in your family. And obviously asking specifically about symptoms and how they might be affecting you. And for physical examination, you're wanting to see is there any obvious stigmata that we can pick up signs that suggest that you have advanced liver disease. And on the ultrasound, you're really looking to see if there's another reason why these tests are abnormal. So is there a blockage there, for example, from a stone that might be causing a similar abnormality in the liver tests? And then subsequently, after doing your specific liver tests, you're wanting to check to look at the antibodies, these PBC specific antibodies and other autoimmune antibodies and excluding viruses to make sure we get the diagnosis right. So we want to confirm your diagnosis based on an elevated alkaline phosphatase in these PBC specific antibodies. And on the right hand side, it talks very much about liver biopsy, and I've covered that in the last slide. Then really, we want to think about starting therapy early. And so all patients who are diagnosed with PBC should be offered first line therapy. And first line therapy is ursodeoxycholic acid, which is a natural occurring bile acid, which the idea of it is to try and sort of flush out some of the um, abnormal um, uh, bile out of the liver. So this is just a slide on ursodeoxycholic acid, and I'll go back to the last slide I was on. So it's the idea of ursodeoxycholic acid is really to slow down the damage within the liver. It's well tolerated in most patients. So those patients who tend to have poor tolerance of it will often have GI related side effects. So nausea, bloating, diarrhea, but in 90% or more patients, it's actually very well tolerated. Once you start it, it's a lifelong medication. So it's not a medication you have for three months and then stop or even a year and then stop unless you're not tolerant to it. And the amount of the drug really depends on your weight. And I think we all have to remember that your weight will change over time and it will depend on a variety of different factors. So actually your weight, your, your calculation of how much drug that you take also changes over time. And there is an ursodeoxycholic acid dose calculator available on the PBC um, um, foundation related app. And it's quite important to be able to think about making sure that as a, as a patient that you advocate for yourself and that you know uh, what your weight is so we can calculate your dose. And obviously as a physician, for us to make sure that we do that at regular intervals. On the left hand side, it, um, you can see the response to ursodeoxycholic acid really does determine um, whether or not you have good survival without an adverse event, um, dividing into responders and non-responders at a 12 month interval. And I'll go in to talk about that a little later. So if I go back to that previous slide, you want to initiate first line therapy with ursodeoxycholic acid. And alongside that, you want to perform a baseline clinical assessment. So we will be asking very much, apart from the simple demographics, about whether or not you have evidence of cirrhosis, so liver scarring, and if you've developed any complications of that. And that might include fluid in the tummy, evidence of dilated blood vessels in the gullet, any evidence of previous bleeding, any evidence of infection within the fluid in the tummy. So that's really important as questions for us. And then also obviously making sure we cover your symptoms and also some of the coexisting autoimmune diseases you may or may not have, your cardiovascular risk and any evidence of metabolic syndrome 
and thinking about sicker complex. And the key investigations that will be done at that time point include baseline blood tests, a liver ultrasound if it hasn't been done already and it should have already been done, but at that point what we're looking at at the liver ultrasound is to think about are there any signs of portal hypertension or advanced liver disease? So does it look like the liver is getting smaller or becoming more nodular or regular? And does it look like the spleen is getting bigger or is there any fluid we weren't expecting? And at that time point, we would also offer you a, a liver stiffness measurement in, in an ideal world. And that liver stiffness measurement is a non-invasive way of being able to look rather than doing a biopsy um, at how much scarring you may have in your liver. And there are certain cutoffs that we use to look at. And with regards to the liver stiffness measurement, that's usually done by something called a fibro scan. Um, um, with, within the clinic. And then lastly, we want to think about bone density and metabolic bone disease is an important thing in the context of any disease that causes cholestasis of the liver, and particularly for PVC. We know a lot of patients are osteopenic. In other words, they have thinning of the bones, and then over time they can get osteoporosis, which means that the bones are even thinner and they're much more liable to fracture. So we should be able to offer patients checking of the vitamin D and replacement if it's low, and also a DEXA bone scan so that we can monitor that and start appropriate treatment. And at this time point, once we're on therapy, we can think about the pre-treatment staging and risk stratification. And that really can be determined in individual patients depending on their age, their gender, the biochemical markers we see and the disease stage in order for each patient to get personalized care. And you should be expecting personalized care. And so very broadly, dividing things here into colours, you've got your low risk category on the left, your intermediate to high risk category in the middle, and then thinking about those people who have to be referred early for further assessment, including thinking about liver transplantation um, and or just tertiary assessment if that's not appropriate. So really briefly to talk through these, low risk is when you've got really low levels of high alkaline phosphatase, your bilirubin may be normal, your albumin, which is a marker of synthetic function, may be normal, and you have early or no fibrosis. And that's great. And we can then think about how regularly we follow you up, because actually that's a really good prognostic sign. Next, we're thinking about those patients who might have an intermediate or high risk. And these are patients who we want to be following up a bit more carefully, a bit more closely, and thinking about re-evaluating earlier. And these are patients who may be diagnosed at a slightly younger age, so I mentioned the average age before of PBC diagnosis, you know, maybe in your 50s, but actually if you're diagnosed less than 45 years, then actually that's one factor that we think might increase your risk of developing a progression of the disease. So we want to look at you a bit more carefully. If you've got a high alkaline phosphatase greater than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, um, that's another factor. If your bilirubin's abnormal, outside one of the most common causes of bilirubin being abnormal, which is called Gilbert's, which is a a sort of genetic inherited condition that we see in lots of patients um, where you can't completely process the bilirubin. So once that's been excluded, if your bilirubin is still abnormal, that's something to be aware of. And again, if your albumin is low or you have some evidence of advanced fibrosis or early signs of cirrhosis, you're in that intermediate to high risk category. And then lastly, in the red category are people who have got quite significant advanced liver disease, but may have developed this fluid may have developed bleeding or dilated blood vessels, are persistently jaundice, um, or have really significant um, itching. And I obviously mentioned before that severity of symptoms and severity of disease do not correlate. But in a, a small group of patients who have um, what we call ductopenic disease, in other words, their ducts are completely gone, they first present with really intense itching. And that could be something that we have to think about when referring for urgent assessment. And then the follow-up and the frequency of follow-up can then be based on that first risk assessment. So at the 12-month time point, and in those patients who we've deemed as intermediate or high risk, probably at the six-month time point, we can start thinking about what the biochemical response to ursodeoxycholic acid is, and also, is there any evidence of progression of disease? And we assess that, again, by the two factors we talked about before, by looking up our patients' blood tests by thinking about whether or not there's any evidence of advancing fibrosis on the fibroscan. And alongside that, and never forgetting that, 
we need to make sure we're asking about symptoms. We need to think about metabolic bone health. We need to think about overlapping risks, including cardiovascular and metabolic syndrome. Now, risk stratification tools that have been developed, actually, they're quite complex. They can be confusing for patients and also physicians who don't use them regularly. Um, and we have these surrogate endpoints. And as you probably see on the table in front of you, we've got these binary definitions, which are the first six or so um, listed, all listed by the place at which they were created. And then the more recently developed continuous scoring system, both the UK PBC and Globe score. And the idea at different time points is to try and determine whether or not patients have responded appropriately to ursidoxicolic acid or UDCA and to work out whether or not there are increased risk of disease progression. Probably the most frequently used um, is, is the Paris criteria, um, but all of these criteria are based on a combination of the bilirubin, the alkaline phosphatase and or the gamma GT and albumin. And then, as I mentioned, you have these continuous scoring systems that gives you an idea about progression over a period of time. I mentioned before about elastography and liver stiffness. I think the key thing to say here is that, you know, patients should um, be able to access elastography or have a liver stiffness measurement. It's usually a bedside scan that's either done in the clinic or sometimes patients are referred to a community clinic where you have a, a fibro scan outside of your original clinic appointment. And that's just because liver stiffness measurements over time have been associated with outcomes. And as I mentioned before, there are cutoffs with regards to what we consider to be a higher rate of progression in the absence of any other comorbidities like fatty liver or autoimmune liver disease. So when you're on treatment, we then re-risk stratify, depending or not on whether or not you have improved your alkaline phosphatase. And we do know that a proportion of patients, anywhere between 25 and 50 percent, won't adequately respond to ursidoxicolic acid. Now, these original guidelines were based on an, an improved response to ursidoxicolic acid. They don't mention normalization of alkaline phosphatase, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that in the course of the day. But an adequate response in the low risk category um, includes an alkaline phosphatase less than five times the upper limit of normal, a normal bilirubin, and no real evidence of progression of fibrosis. So if that was the case, you would be classified as low risk. You continue your single agent ursidoxicolic acid and continue to have annual assessments um, of response, or more frequently, if there were other risk factors you were concerned about. In your intermediate to high risk group, we have patients who still have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, rising bilirubin levels, falling albumin, so the synthetic function of the liver is not so good, or evidence on their fibro scan that they are getting progression. And in those patients, you're a lot more cautious and you think about further evaluation and actually potentially referral, depending on where you are, to consider second line therapies. And then lastly, again, if we think about those patients who have already developed cirrhosis or have severe intractable symptoms, if there is evidence over time of decompensation, in other words, the fluids, evidence of bleeding, evidence of infection, um, or they've developed some evidence of portal hypertension, for example, even on their ultrasound with an enlarged spleen, um, they're persistently jaundiced, then we think about further assessment to transplant units or to high-end tertiary care. With regards to second line therapy, there are different systems in different places. Mostly in the UK, there's a kind of hub and spoke model that's been set up whereby individual hubs um, will run autoimmune and PBC multidisciplinary meetings. And these multidisciplinary meetings will be made up of um, physicians who are interested specifically in autoimmune diseases such as PBC, but also a specialist pharmacist in some institutes, a specialist nurse and other consultant colleagues or fellows who have an interest in the disease. And cases are discussed thinking about the role of second line therapy. That's not the case in every institute and it's definitely not completely standard across Europe or elsewhere. The options for second line therapy are either our only FDA licensed therapy, which is currently a beta colic acid, or the consideration of unlicensed therapies as per existing guidelines, such as visa fibrate or even phenofibrate, 
particularly in patients who may have significant itch. There's also the option, and it's a very important option, to enroll patients in clinical trials. And that needs to be considered in individuals because it's important that you have the opportunity to be able to enroll in clinical trials that are ongoing, um, in addition or you know, separate to having um, what we call now standard of care. And this then determines how frequently we monitor and follow up patients. And actually, we would usually advocate, depending on your risk profile, monitoring blood tests every three to six months, monitoring evolution of fibrosis in terms of the fibro scan every year, or potentially every two years if you are low risk, and doing an abdominal ultrasound in those patients who do have advanced liver scarring or cirrhosis every six months. And that's a continuous evaluation to look for evidence of disease progression, to look for things that change alongside, and again, I can't iterate enough, alongside not forgetting about the importance of symptoms and symptom management. And I guess that's where I put my second to last slide, is just to say that even though these guidelines are really tackling a lot of the biochemical and, um, and fiber, fiber scan based parameters, you know, at no point do we forget and the importance of symptoms. And physicians don't do it well, um, but actually it's really important to think about those symptoms and to ask about those symptoms and the impact on your quality of life. And they specifically include obviously itching, we mentioned about fatigue and brain fog, um, but also thinking about the role of dyslipidemia. Um, so we know that in almost 80% of patients, cholesterol will be high, even though that may not have a direct impact in terms of ischemic heart disease. Um, we do know that some people have metabolic risk, so there may be an independent reason to starting a, an anti-cholesterol agent. And as I mentioned about metabolic bone disease and trying to prevent fractures developing and thinking about advocating early to make sure that we get appropriate scans and monitoring. So in conclusion to my roundup, PBC, we know it's a long-term autoimmune disease that affects the bile ducts within the liver. It's becoming more commonly diagnosed because we probably pick it up earlier, in addition to the fact that it may be more prevalent for the reasons I've mentioned about environmental triggers. We diagnose it based on liver biochemistry and disease-specific autoantibodies. And once we diagnose it, you should start a weight-based dose of ursidioxicolic acid. And that weight-based dose should be looked at at regular intervals, depending on your current weight. Alongside that, we need to do baseline assessments to risk stratify and really personalize care and follow up. And then at 12 months or six months, if you're intermediate to high risk, we need to be making decisions about second line therapy in parallel alongside symptom management and associated conditions. And so that you know, we have these consensus guidelines, they're beautifully depicted, but actually sometimes these care pathways, which are simplified decision management tools, really help both physicians and also patients keep on top of their disease. And I think it's a really exciting time for PBC um, in terms of being advocating for it. And, and we have this option of a very personalized care approach. And you'll be hearing lots more during the course of the morning and also afternoon with regards to options that going forward for both symptoms and also uh, clinical trials. Thank you very much. I think, wow, wonderful. So session one, and we've only got these many questions. You've let the team down. Come on, we need more questions. No, right. So <laughs> there's more questions. This will take a while for us to get through, but we will try and get through every single question we can, okay? We'll have a couple for Emma that are specific to our talk. We've got Dave Jones coming in. So we will go through as many of the questions as we can. Emma, thank you so, so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation and really, really simplified it. I've got a couple of follow-up questions, if I may. Of course. So the first one, so we're quoting you, the urso is a naturally occurring bile. So there's two questions that are coming from this. So one, in terms of the ursodeoxycholic acid that patients are given as medicine, mm -hmm. is that actual bare bile? Is it synthetic? And then the other question around bile is to do with the fact that if we're adding more bile into our system, are we not creating more problems than we're fixing? So could you address those two, please? Yeah, so it, that's my area. It's, it's a synthetic, and you probably know that, but it, it's a synthetic bile acid. And um, I suppose what the idea of it behind it, from my understanding very much, is that it's trying to make a slightly more toxic bile acid. 
I've got a bit of a, a bit of a can you hear me? Can you hear me? with some feedback okay. yeah we can hear you you're getting feedback yeah but that's okay as long as you don't hear me with feedback that's okay um so yeah so i, I think i think the, the the rationale for my understanding behind it um is that actually you're improving the bile flow with the synthetic bile acid um there's lots of positive properties that have been postulated that have um that the ursidoxicolic ha acid has with regards to improving not just um, bile flow but reducing toxicity, um, so I think that's really the mechan the main its main mechanism of action. Even though there's lots of unknowns still exactly of how it does that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, on the topic of urso, so it says urso slows down the damage in the liver. Can it reverse the changes seen, for example, in fibro scan? Are you can it reduce fibrosis or once the fibrosis damage is done, is it permanent? Mm, it's a really good question. And I think it's a difficult question to answer. Um, and the reason I say that is because we do see in other liver conditions that you can get reversal and regression of fibrosis. And that's in particular in conditions where you have a large inflammatory component. And in the case of PBC, we do know that there is inflammation within the bile ducts, even though the mechanism of that inflammation may be very different. I don't know of any evidence, but correct me if I'm wrong, that ursodeoxycholic acid itself can um, reverse fibrosis. I don't know that, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I think it's possible, think possible in the context of PBC to potentially be able to not be able to stop but hopefully be able to reduce and regress the underlying scarring that's happened in the in way that we can do other inflammatory liver conditions. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, last question, if I may. Is there any evidence of the effect of herbal remedies on the management of symptoms within PBC? Yeah, again, very good question. Um, I think for different patients, different things work, if I'm honest about it. I'm not aware of any randomized trials in herbal therapies in PBC, um, but very much individual patients will tell me that they have taken something that they feel really helps either their itch or their fatigue. And on, on that note, as long as it's not a hepatotoxic medication, you know, I advocate for patients to take the things that they feel actually is helping them. And I know that on the PBC Foundation and other support groups, you can find things that might actually help your liver disease in terms of your symptoms. And I would advocate patients to look at things that can help them if they want to. And if it works, that's great. Perfect. Thank you. And that was the second last, last, last question. So the last, 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 last question. How easy, expensive is the AMA blood test, please? Oh, how easy is it to get? Very easy. Very easy. Okay. How expensive is it? I, and you know what? Working in the National Health Service, I must admit, I do not know the cost of an AMA test. Um because I've never ordered it privately. Um, so I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, it's very easy to be able to get an AMA as part of a generic liver panel. So if you ask for liver autoantibodies, it comes as standard alongside your ANA and your um, smooth muscle antibody and your LKM1. So usually there's a panel of four and sometimes in some places five liver autoantibodies that were requested together as a single panel. But I do not know privately how much one would have to pay for an AMA. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Emma Culver. Emma, thank you so, so much. Thank you.